Hello, and welcome to this evening's Brookline Booksmith virtual event with author Elizabeth George to celebrate Something to Hide in conversation with Jacqueline Winspear. My name is Rachel, and I'm a bookseller for Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. To those of you who are familiar with our store and who've been to our event series before, it's wonderful to have you back. And to all of you who are here for the first time, welcome. We're so grateful to all of you for being here and supporting authors and an independent bookstore through your participation and your book purchases. Tonight, we are thrilled to have Elizabeth and Jacqueline here with us. Having started composing stories at the age of seven, Elizabeth George is the New York Times bestselling author of 21 psychological suspense novels, four young adult novels, two books of nonfiction, and two short story collections. Her work has been adapted into a British crime drama television series on the BBC and has not surprisingly been honored with the Anthony and Agatha Awards, two Edgar nominations, and both France's and Germany's prize for crime fiction, first prize that is. She now lives in Washington state. Moderator Jacqueline Winspear is the author of the New York Times bestselling The Consequences of Fear, The American Agent, To Die But Once, and In This Grave Hour, as well as 13 other bestselling Maisie Dobbs novels and The Care and Management of Lies, a Dayton Literary Peace Prize finalist. Jacqueline has also published two nonfiction books, a bestselling memoir, This Time Next Year We'll Be Laughing, and What Would Maisie Do?, a journal based upon readers' favorite passages from the Maisie Dobbs series. Her next novel, A Sunlit Weapon, will be published in March 2022. And somehow, between drafting her numerous novels and nonfiction pieces and articles, Jacqueline still manages to dedicate time to her other passion, riding horses. <laughs> <laughs> Originally from the United Kingdom, Jacqueline now divides her time between California and the Pacific Northwest. Now this evening, Elizabeth and Jacqueline will be sharing conversation about something to hide called Unsettling and Thoroughly Involving by Booklist, and a skillfully spun yarn of Murder and Mayhem by Kirkus Reviews. Something to Hide features Detective Sergeant Barbara Havers and Detective Inspector Thomas Lindley working together again, alongside Winston Nakata, as they pursue a police detective's killer and end up discovering far-reaching cultural associations in the process. It's a true honor to have them both here with us tonight. Please join me now in welcoming Elizabeth and Jacqueline. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It, it's actually an enormous honor for me to, uh, you know, to be interviewing or in conversation with Elizabeth because I've been a fan for an awfully long time. <laughs> so this is great. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. It's good to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's good. Um, Right. I have uh, some questions for you, but, you know, it, it, when I was uh, sent the book, here's the book. I'm sure most of you at home have got this. Um, it's what I would call a, an iceberg of a book. And, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I don't mean that because of the heft, which I'll come to later, but it's, you know, they say about an iceberg, you only see 7% of it above the surface. And it's one of those books you might think, yes, this is a mystery book but there's so much more within these pages. It really is, you know, it's, there's a lot within the pages. Um, so I wonder if you could tell us, Elizabeth, about sort of the genesis of the novel. Where did the story come from? What was in your heart when you wrote it? Because it does, and I know people have read this, so I, I you know, I have to be careful about spoilers, but it involves insight into the practice of female genital mutilation. Right. And, um, Anyway, I wonder if you could tell me ab sure. about that genesis. Sure. Um, the, uh, the, the, the idea for the book came to me from a conversation that I had with uh, my goddaughter's aunt. And uh, she is an international lawyer. She and I were both visiting my goddaughter at the exact same time. And she was telling me about something that she was working on with, at that time, with Gloria Steinem and with the British police. And uh, what they were working on is putting an end to female genital mutilation, or as, the, or as it is also called, cutting. Um, she, her particular interest was to... Uh, 
attempt to do away with all kinds of genital cutting, whether it is uh, cutting that is done because of the, uh, the woman herself wanting to reduce the size of part of her genitalia, or whether it's done for traditional and cultural reasons, as is the case in the book. Anyway, when she was telling me about this, I thought, wow, this is really, really uh, asking to be part of one of my novels. And so uh, for I thought about it for a couple of years while I was working on other things. And then when it came time to start this next, this latest Lindley book, I, uh, I decided to, to use that as the foundation for the novel. Mm -hmm. What I thought was interesting was how you reflected the, the broad, broad spread of people that can be involved in this issue. Um, you know, I have a friend who um, is a social worker. I won't say too much more because I don't want her to be fingered by anyone, but so to speak. But she um, she is involved in um, sort of high pressure cases of um, uh, child custody. And mm -hmm. she's, she had to do a lot of training. This was one of the issues that she had to do a lot of training to understand because what happens in your scenario is very similar to something that she sees where you know, there's one parent who wants to do, go ahead to do this for cultural reasons and another who perhaps doesn't, or do they, you know, and see right. between that. So it's, um, you know, and I, I wondered if you can uh, talk about your background research for the book on several levels. And one of the things that intrigued me is, is the setting, which is for the most part, the East End of London. Yeah. And it's, I happen to know it's a very difficult place for people to sometimes get their arms around um, because it's it's been a place where immigrants have come into for centuries because it's the docks, you know, and, mm -hmm. you know, you see these layers of immigration are reflected there. And of course, it was bombed to smithereens in the war. And now it's it's a really trendy area to buy a place. And and yet you've got this uh, all this other undercurrent going on and, and how did you get your arms around that um yeah you know when, whenever i am going to go to a location to do research i begin by reading about that particular location obviously london is an enormous location to, to to get your head around, let alone get your arms around. And so what I generally do is isolate individual areas that I that look intriguing from my reading. And then I go to those areas and see if they're going to work for the novel that I want to write. So I uh, I placed part of the novel in what would strictly be called the East End, that whole area near Whitechapel, mm -hmm. where, uh, and that's where uh, Trinity Green is and where the almshouses are that are that feature in the novel and the, and the chapel. All of the, um, all of the locations are real in my novel. Sometimes I uh, change the name of something, but in this novel, I didn't change the name of anything. So if you had a map, you could go to all of these places and see for yourself what it's like. I'm always um, trying to give a sense of place to the reader. So, uh, so I try to pick up the telling details when I'm there so that I can translate that place into a place that springs to life for the reader. And that was what I was trying to do with, with this one. And what you said, Jackie, about the, uh, the, the immigration to London and how different sections have gone through different changes over time. You know, Brick Lane is really a good example. Yes. That's, I don't use it in this novel, but I have used it before. And, um, and it has been, it's gone through, you know, one community has lived there and then another community and then another community and another community. And that's the same as um, the Ridley Road area where, uh, where the family lives, the Nigerian family. Mm -hmm. um, it has, and now what's interesting is, is it, it's right at this moment, it has a large African community in it, but it's on its way to being gentrified, just like everything else in London is being gentrified. So, uh, so nothing is ever, nothing ever changes. I mean, nothing ever stays the same in London. That's one of the things I like to look at. Yeah. It, it, it always fascinates me, you know, some of those areas that the way they've gone through changes because you know, those big sort of Georgian or, or Victorian homes. I mean, they were merchants' homes originally. They, it was wealthy and then it 
was definitely not wealthy, you know, it's sort of the other end. And um, just as an aside, I remember when I used to work in London in the 70s, I, I, I used to, one of my places I had to visit, Queen Mary College, which was on the Mile End Road. Um, mm. You know, the, I mean, there was some great sort of Jewish restaurants down there. There was Bloom's, you know, the famous delicatessen and so mm. on. So, um, so it was interesting reading about it and, and uh, the, the way you really got it, you know, how it's, <clears throat> how it's developed now. And uh, yeah, so um, let's talk about your characters. Um, how would you say your, and I call your staple characters grow and change with this novel? And I know your fans are anxious to hear more about uh, Lindley and Havers. Um, and I guess the question of character is how you keep them growing and changing all the time. And also you've got, um, you know, other characters you've woven in, plus you've got uh, Simon and Deborah St. James. I'm one of these people as a reader, I love uh, the ensemble cast, you know, Magnificent Seven, you know, like on Ocean's Eleven, but <laughs> tell, tell me, <laughs> tell me about your characters and, and how they grow and change and develop and so on. Yeah, you know, I, I'm like you. I like to I like ensemble pieces too. <laughs> yeah. Not only in you know in film or on television, but also in books. And when I uh, when I find a series that I that I like, I really want to see the characters grow and change during that time during the you know the course of the novels. Mm -hmm. Sort of like Winston Graham's books about um, about about that whole section in South Southern Cornwall that he that he mm -hmm. writes about in the Bulldark books mm -hmm. and um, I love that because uh, first of all you you get to experience the characters for a longer period of time but the characters don't get um, don't get tiresome because their li their lives continue to change and um, I never wanted to write a series where and I'm sure you can appreciate this Jackie I, I never wanted to write a series where the character is frozen in time place and circumstance the way Agatha Christie did with her characters or Poirot and and Miss Marple especially, you know those characters were always the same, um, and I didn't want to do that. And mostly because I don't like reading those kind of books, I want to see something more happen. And uh, additionally, the you know the more characters I give myself, the more options I have in a book. So my characters mm -hmm. uh, don't exist in a void where all their relatives have conveniently died in a in a plane crash or something. <laughs> You know, people have siblings, people have parents, people have cousins, aunts, and uncles, and that allows me to bring forward different characters at a different period of time and show aspects of them that, that you wouldn't see in a character that is always the same and is frozen. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I created them to be characters who gave me some wiggle room, gave me options. Yeah. And I know as a reader, I've always really appreciated that. I remember when I first started reading your, your novels and, and a friend and I would, well, what do you think about what happened there? You know, and it was, it was that discussion around character, which I, I think is, is so important and you really bring out and very much in, in this book. Um, so one of the questions I know that uh, uh, sort of others might have asked you this in the past, but issues of British class distinctions there, Again, it's something else that outsiders uh, find it difficult to grasp, you know. Um, because and, it's so subtle now. Yeah, it's much more subtle than it, it used to be. It really is. Yeah. And, um, and, and to give you an example, when I first came here, I, I, it was interesting to me that factory workers were called middle class because if you work with your hands in Britain, it, you can be earn a fortune, send your kids to private school. You are still working class. Right. You know, right, and it's... Yeah. It's, it, it's a badge of honor uh, among people uh, as well. But um, so, you know, this whole issue of class and class sort of tends to trump race all the way in, in Britain. And that's a broad brush comment. But can you tell us how you, you grew to understand the distinctions over time and, and how you weave them into your work and how you keep tabs on that as well? Because as you say, it's, it cha it's, it's so dynamic. Yeah, it does. It changes a lot over time. Um, 
Well, you know, I, I've always read a lot of British novels and I have always watched a lot of British television. And you really can't do those things without noticing that there, there, are, um, there are class distinctions that are made. Additionally, my, um, my British editor was a, a graduate of Cambridge University and <laughs> he had gone to Charterhouse, which is one of the, oh. the, the British would you call it a public school? It's a public school. It's a public yeah. School. And so he used, to, he used to say to me, I wish I could do his voice. He had the plummiest accent and he was the most delightful person. But he used to say to me, you know, oh, no, 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 no. We have no class system here in England. <laughs> And well, I used to say to him, well, that's because of the class that you're in, Tony. You know, as Mandy because... Rice Davis said to the judge, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, uh, you know, and there, and there's all, there are all kinds of subtleties, including the way, not only the way you, they use language, but the, the words that they choose. And that has to be, you have to be really careful with that too. I mean, my God, you know, say toilet and then you're just totally Im immediately, everybody knows where you're from or what your class is because you've used the word toilet. Um, and there's all kinds of words like that, you know, mm -hmm. saying couch instead of sofa or divan instead of, so I mean, all kinds. Yes, and you don't have a, you're not many settees in, in the upper classes. Yeah, that's right. That's, and there's definitely not a three piece suite. In oh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, you know, I just think over time and exposure to, especially to, to, um, to British novels, you, I saw these things. And I think we're possibly losing Elizabeth. I don't know, Rachel, I think we've frozen I, a bit there. I think it is frozen for a moment. Yeah. Do you want to come in with, say, a couple of questions from the audience? I noticed that someone asked about Britain, whether Britain is a multiracial society, and it, it, it has been for centuries. It's not been without its problems. I'll answer that, definitely starting in the 50s. Um, uh, but... Uh, um, and in fact, it holds a, a record, I think, at the moment, or a statistic. It has more multiracial, multicultural marriages than any other country in the world. And I read that just recently. But I, so I've answered someone's question there that I saw pop up. But why don't you? Oh, is Elizabeth back? No, she's not back in yet. In the process of. In the process of coming back. So why don't you ask a couple of questions? Oh, you. yes. So let's see here. We do have a few already in the Q&A box. Thank you for everyone who has submitted them. Let's see. See if we can answer any of them for us. Answer Elizabeth. any of them for her. <laughs> I know. Um, you know. I, I, can't, I shouldn't presume to want to answer anything for this with George. <laughs> we do. Something is happening. Reach. There we go. There she is. I think the sound is about to come back. It looks like it's connecting. Am I back? You are You're back. back. You're back. I had Thanks. to get off. I got off altogether and then just uh, just went back. We were talking about class, or lack thereof. Yes, and I, and I can't remember what cogent point I was making. I think I was talking about the fact that I, you know, having read so many British novels, it's not, it's not totally difficult to figure out what people are actually referring to in these novels. You, if you have any imagination whatsoever, yeah. or if you've read enough, you, you yeah. can figure it out. Yeah, and... I'm st I can almost feel a little chip on my shoulder growing, having you having, telling me about your editor there. <laughs> it's, um, the epigraph in your book. Yes. Your book, for those who suffer, those who endure, and those who fight. Mm -hmm. I, I love that. I sort of want to stick it on my wall. In fact, I probably will. Can you tell us about that? Tell us how you came up with that and how, how you felt. Well, after uh, reading a lot about, um, about female genital mutilation and after seeing a number of, and listening to a number of interviews of women who had had this done on them and uh, 
and reading the information that's available on exactly what is done to a woman, depending upon what level of uh, what type of FGM she has. I mean, it just seemed to me that, um, that, that those were the people that I wanted to dedicate the, the book to for those who suffer because they've, they've had this and there is, uh, you know, it's, it, it causes tremendous uh, suffering, physical, physical suffering. Mm-hmm pain in uh, women who've had it done to them and uh and for the women that are you know enduring this as sort of a legacy of uh, of what's happened to them i think that um you know they've been they've been robbed of well obviously robbed of sensation um robbed of sexual pleasure and have had their lives irreparably changed um, by this, by this, this thing that is done to them out of a belief that this is really going to make them pure and acceptable as marriage partners for men. I mean, that just sort of makes me want to shoot myself. And then, uh, and, and then, then there are the women who are fighting against it. And, uh, I listened to a Ted, Ted talk by, uh, one of the, uh, one of the fighters in, in England who runs a, uh, a group house or an organization really for, uh, for women to get involved in who either had this done to them or who are really want to fight it in a large way. And uh, she is also a victim of it. And when you hear these women talk about exactly what happened to them when they had this done, it's it's just horrifying. It's not like uh, you go to a hospital and have this little procedure done. It's like you don't know what's going to happen to you. You're seven years old. You brought it into a house. You have somebody kneeling on your arm, somebody else kneeling on your legs. I mean, it's just really Horrible. And of course, there is no anesthetic. And you're really lucky if they own a scalpel, which they really generally it's don't. Rusty razor blade. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rusty razor blade, piece of glass, you know. And I know that sounds that sounds um, that sounds so horrific. And indeed it is. And that's what's going on. Yes. Uh, so I, in, in large part, I wanted to open people's eyes to, to this and to other forms of abuse that are practiced on women in the name of keeping them pure and available so that they will be acceptable to a man. It's, it's just horrific. I, I remember just as an aside a few years ago watching this documentary and I mean, take my hat off to this this young woman she's a very famous model so famous I can't remember her name right now but she had this had happened to her I think she was originally from Eritrea or somewhere like that and it happened to her as a child and she finally decided to speak out about it and I mean it's just heartbreaking heartbreaking um moving on from that um you do an enormous amount of research and planning before you even begin to write your novel. Um, you've described the process in, and in two very best-selling books on writing. Um, do you still employ that process? Uh, it, it, and also, uh, has it become sh- a shorter task? Has it developed? Uh, has it developed over the years? And yes, and how really has your pre-writing planning? developed and changed over the years? Because I know you've also taught this method very successfully. Um, I would say that over the years, it's become um, a little bit more in-depth, a little bit more complicated than it was before as I add various elements to it. Mm-hmm. I started out in the, in the very, very beginning just uh, jotting down sort of chapter by chapter what I thought might happen in that chapter. And I saw fairly soon after that, that um, based on what my editor was uh, asking me, the questions she was asking, that if I didn't want to have my editor asking me a lot of questions after the fact, it would behoove me to create the characters in advance. And that's what I began with, with the creation of character. And, uh, and so I went from there to the creation of place and the importance of place, especially in, in a crime novel. And sometimes the place I'm creating is, is very, um, you know, very detailed and complicated, like the school I created in Well Schooled and Murder. Um, I created a British 
public school or private school, depending on how you how you look at, at the way the terms used, um, and and created the entire thing: the campus itself, the buildings, the uh, names of the buildings. The I actually wrote a prospectus for the school for parents who wanted to send their kids there to die, and uh, you know, and things <laughs> like that. So uh, so it, it so I do. I do things that I believe will help me with my writing. Um, I don't do things just because, because I'm superstitious or anything. I do it because it is proven beneficial to me. Uh, one time I heard uh, the actor Daniel Day Lewis being interviewed about his process of acting where he actually becomes the character and everybody in his life has to act as if he is, for example, Abraham Lincoln. And uh, he said something that, that really was really kind of unforgettable. He, he said, if I knew an easier way to do it, I would do it that way. And so it's the same thing for me. If I knew an easier way to, to write a novel without going through all of this, I would do it that way. But I also want to do it in a way that puts me in a position of presenting to my editor a really, really strong novel. And this is uh, this works for me. And I think everybody needs a process of some kind. Mine just happens to be, you know, more involved than, than a lot of other people's. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, given that, um, you know, you, you, you know, you've obviously there are people <clears throat> that are present here watching you and listening to you and they're writers or they want to be writers. And so, but you've got a stellar output. I mean, you have you know, your, your novels, your series, you're writing young adult, you've written um, short stories, nonfiction. What is, you know, uh, and certainly we both know there are authors that write two or three novels a year, but possibly would most definitely not with the background work that you do. What's the key to the stellar output that you can, you're, you're incredibly productive and you keep, you keep the standards up there? So what, what do you think is the key for that? Um, oh, I well, really want to know this. <laughs> well, the, you know, the first thing is that, um, that for me, writing is, uh, as a creative process, helps me to fight chronic depression. And so when I'm writing, I'm not depressed. Even if a day goes badly, I might be discouraged about that day, but I'm not suffering from depression overall. And I was told a number of years ago by a psychiatrist that uh, the way he put it, you're just the type of person who is uh, going to get depressed if your brain is not staying creative. And I you know, therefore had to come up with ways in between books to keep my brain creative and, uh, you know, or keep my brain occupied. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when my, when a book is done, I don't take a whole lot of free time, free time after that, um, maybe a couple of months, as much as four months, but generally not, not that long. Um, because I know that it's important for my mental health. Additionally, you know, I really love to write. I never have to drag myself to the, uh, the, the word processor in the morning. I never have to, I never look at a day as, oh my God, I'm gonna have to write today. Uh, you know, I, I love writing, always have loved writing, which I think is real helpful um, toward, you know, toward my output. Mm -hmm. What's your, um, so do, I'm one of these people, I, I for example, I, I, there's a, a rhythm to my day. Mm. These are, this is when I do this, this, and this, you know, boom, there has to be a boom, 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 boom. And it's probably the same every day, definitely when I'm working yeah. on a novel. And I just wonder what your rhythm to your day is, you know, um, I know this is getting down to nitty gritty and nuts and bolts, but I think a lot of people are interested in this sort of thing. The, the rhythm of your day, how many hours would you say you write for? Or some, some writers, they say, well, I'm not going to stop until I've done 1200 words. I think that's Stephen King, you know, he does 1200 words a day, come what may. So I just wondered what the rhythm of your day is and that uh, that supports your productivity and, and your creative your creativity. It's sort of like what you were saying, Jackie. I have a I have a, um, a schedule that I stick to as as best I can. Um, sometimes 
uh, sometimes the, the volume of work I have makes it, makes it tough for me to stick to that schedule. But as far as the writing is concerned, I, uh, if I'm doing the rough draft, I write five pages a day. And if I'm having a really good, uh, good day and I'm on a roll, I might write more than that. But I always write five pages a day as, as a minimum amount. And, uh, but, but see, in addition to that, I am um, studying Italian, taking Italian with a, uh, with an Italian woman as my instructor who piles on the homework. <laughs> The homework, oh my god, and that that sort of eats into my eats into my time, and you know, as does things that you don't think would take that much time, like opening mail and uh, yeah. you know, and writing, you know, paying bills and you know stuff like that. Uh, I I had always many many years had a personal assistant, both when I lived in Huntington Beach and then when I lived on Whidbey Island, and uh, for the the first. Well, we moved here in 2018. So until uh, I think of November of this last year, I was doing everything myself without an assistant. And then um, I was, I, I sort of, I don't know how to describe it, sort of fell into uh, in a wonderful assistant who works for me on an as needed basis. And she was, the way I got introduced to her is my next door neighbor in my, where my office is, it's in a condo. And this is the next door neighbor in the condo. He just, I must have looked really haggard one day. And he, he said to me, have you ever thought about getting an assistant? <laughs> and I, and I thought, well, I mean, I, I didn't know how I would actually employ an assistant because I was doing everything. And then, so she came and suggested, why don't we just try it out? And uh, so, so she's been, uh, you know, working on an as needed basis for me ever since then. And it's really, really helped me so much, especially when it comes to any kind any technical thing. Uh, she knows that yeah. uh, if it's technical, I'm not going to be able to do it. And I'll, I'll say, you have to come over and help me. I can't do this. Is she 12? It seems that 12 year olds are the best. It's really, really. <laughs> yeah. It's like yeah. eight year olds. Everybody needs their own personal eight year old. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, it's, it's so funny. Someone once suggested to me that, you know, I should get an assistant. And I thought, I don't have time to talk to an assistant. I, how can I have an assistant? I would never get over that hump. Um, I said I'd come back to this question, the question of heft, because I've noticed that, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, before I was doing the interview with you, um, you know, there are comments from readers and uh, about the fact that your books have become larger and larger. I personally like that. I like to think I'm going to get stuck into something here. And I, I also have a firm belief that all this business of texting is shrinking people's brains and shrinking our ability for sustained um, concentration on the written word. That's a good yeah. point. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's it, you know, anyway, it grieves me because I think, uh, you know, books like this, you know what you, you've got your iceberg right there, but... The fact is that your books have got longer. And um, is that a, as a result, do you think, of this intense amount of work you do? There's a lot of storytelling to go in there. Or is it just yeah. that you, you really just would, wanted to move to this space? How did that happen, that your books became longer? It, it, it happened because I um, started probably looking more deeply into the subplots. My books have always had subplots, but um, in the earliest books, a subplot was dealt with in maybe four scenes in the novel. And so the, the subplot would be interspersed and, and basically it would tell an entire story that was thematically unified with the rest of the book. But, but as I began um, exploring more subplots or exploring subplots in more depth, that made the books longer. Um, I, I always begin, you know, I, I never set out to write to write a long book. Believe me, if I could, uh, if I could do it in uh, 500 manuscript pages, I would do it in 500 manuscript pages, but it just hasn't worked out that way for me for uh, quite some time because of the number of subplots that I have. Um, I like having subplots because uh, it, 
Well, it ele- uh, to me, it elevates the book. It's not just about the crime and the investigation into the crime. It's about a lot of stuff. Yes. So, yeah. so this, yeah, this particular book is about, about mostly about women owning their own power. That there are women in the in the book who don't recognize that uh, that they have power, they have agency. All they have to do is is step forward into it, and uh, and that goes from you know from the character of Deborah St. James to uh, to the character of of Monifa, who is the uh, the the. Um, the wife and the mother who's involved in this situation with um, with FGM. So I so it's that exploration I think that takes more time. Mm. I think I think this is a, a very important book from that perspective. Um, not least, I mean, this is a, a certain type of violence against women, but the rise in violence against women in the in the past, I don't know how many years, has, has been startling. Mm-hmm. Um, and particularly, I think, also since the COVID epidemic, um, you know, more people stuck at home, et cetera. And, it's, and every day you read something horrible about something that's happened to a woman in particular. And I, yes. I find it, 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 those, it's sort of the subplots of our lives that are actually very, very important. And the more they're, I think, explored in fiction that is in, incredibly um, accessible mm-hmm. and wrapped up in story. I mean, I think you've done a, a, ter- a ter- terrific job there. I really, I really do. Well, and, and I think you pointed out something really important, Jackie, and that is that, um, you know, it, it's becoming more, there, there's becoming more violence against women uh, and more robbing women of their power and agency than there was in the past. Mm-hmm. Um, and and what's, what is uh, so maddening about it is that women are robbed of agency by men. Um, you know, a good example is the, uh, you know, is the whole situation uh, with, uh, with the termination of pregnancy in the United States, and the people making the big decisions about this, they're all men. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, Old and guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And the message they send is uh, women do not have the right, the right to have control. Not only do they not have control over their own bodies, but they don't have the right to have control over their own bodies. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, you know, scratch the surface of that, and you're going to find a whole lot of very, very angry women. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm looking at the time, so I have to move on with a a couple of questions here. Um, I'm curious about this. Is there a literary form that you've, you've not tried, you've not delved into, but you'd like to, that you'd like to try? And, And I'll tell you why I'm asking that is that my dad, for example, loved Westerns. And because of that, because my father passed away some years ago, I've always wanted to have a go at a Western. And I I don't know if I'll ever, you know, make that dream come true, but I suddenly thought I'd love to know if if there's something Elizabeth would like to try, but she's never tried and she might. You know what? What popped into my head as soon as you, uh, as soon as you brought that up is the epistolary novel. I would love to do that. It, to me, it's astonishing how, uh, you know, how people can, through a series of, you know, back and forth letters, tell an entire story. And if I were to choose something out of all the many different forms, that, that would be what I would choose. And, um, of course, now it would probably be the, the novel told through instant messaging, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> through through letters, unless you you know went back in time when that was the only you know that was the main way of communicating with someone that didn't live right with you. So that yeah, that'd be it. That would be fun. I, I've always for the people that pull it off, and I think we've seen that it it's really good fun. Um, oh yeah, to see how I, I, I there was an author. I uh, gosh, I wish my memory were better. Sometimes uh, a few years ago, who. She wrote a whole novel with um, literally cuttings from magazines, with fo- with photo- with pictures from magazines. It was just terrific. I, I-, I thought yeah. it was a, it was a, a, she did a brilliant job. And I'm I'm really sorry that I can't remember her name. I'm going to have to put it on my um, Facebook page or something as soon as I find the book. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting one. That's an interesting one. 
Um, before I'm, um, I sort of hand over to Rachel to ask some of the audience questions, um, I know everybody's going to want to know this, if you can say anything. What's next for Lindley and Havers? What's next? Oh, <laughs> well, um, what's next is that um, the next book will take place in, in Cornwall. It is the third of my novels to take place in Cornwall. And... Uh, and it, it, this, this particular, uh, we've looked at Cornwall from, you know, Lindley and his family's perspective uh, in, in A Suitable Vengeance. We looked at Cornwall from the perspective of the, uh, of the, the, the surfing community and mm -hmm. the, uh, those involved in physical activities on the west coast of Cornwall in Careless and Red. And this one is going to look at um, the mining aspect mm -hmm. of of Cornwall, and uh, and it will it will involve it, it will involve Lindley. It'll involve Havers. It will involve um, uh, people close to Lindley. It'll involve his family. So uh, I'm really I'm looking forward to it. I haven't seen those people in a while. Oh, that's really that's a really interesting subject matter. It's the, the first time I went to Cornwall when I was a kid. I was seven. I went with my aunt and cousins and uh, a couple of cousins. And I can remember we went, to, we were walking near an old Cornish tin mine, which actually had not been sealed. People didn't care about that in those days. And I went trooping, oh, I can I a place, what will I find in here? And I can still remember my aunt saying, get out of there now, you're going to fall in. But it's got a wonderful history. And of course, it's the mining there has got a history that connects with the United States as well. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, so it does. Well, now we've, uh, we know what you're up to next. Um, I think it's time for Rachel to come back and let's the audience ask, ask some questions. Thanks, Elizabeth. My goodness me, this has been such an Thank honor. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> such Jackie. Such an honor. <laughs> you know, it looks like we have already a bunch of questions in here. So thanks to everyone who's put them in our Q&A box. Looks like there's one that may or may not, uh, looks like might be connected to the question you just talked about in terms of um, what's next? We have someone who's wondering in particular about whether Deborah and it looks like Simon will be brought back at any point. Well, Deborah and Simon are uh, major players in in this book, so um, so they're already <laughs> they, yeah, they're in, they're in something to hide in, in a big way. Um, Deborah is uh, becomes sort of intimately involved with uh, with what's going on in the uh, in the major plot of the novel as well as in the subplots and uh, and they're all there. Her husband's there, Simon's there, her father's there, their dog is there, the cat's there. So uh, yeah, so it's uh, it's a step forward in the relationship between Deborah and her husband. That is excellent. That'll be a very happy discovery then when your book arrives um, to the person who asked that. Um, let's see here. There are so many. We actually have quite a few that are talking about Barbara in particular, Barbara Havers. Um, we have folks saying that they're fascinated by her, that she is the most interesting character to them. Everyone's sort of wondering about how she has evolved, um, both how she originated and how she's evolving and specifically wondering about her wardrobe choices. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Barbara Haver has evolved uh, from what I set out her, for her to be, which is a foil to Lindley. When I first created uh, Thomas Lindley and, and had him in action in a book without Barbara Havers, and that was A Suitable Vengeance, um, which I had uh, written as my, well, that was my second attempt at a British crime novel. And it ultimately was published as my fourth novel. But um, in my first two attempts at crime novels, the uh, Thomas Lindley was the, this character who was at the end of describing him or uh, was sort of like unbelievable and perhaps not particularly likable because he was just, uh, you know, so he was just almost too much. And so I thought, you know, the reader, the reader may really have trouble with this character. So um, I did something that's called prescribing the symptom. 
And I decided to prescribe the reader's symptom of hating Lindley by creating a character who hates Lindley. And what that does is it sort of invites the reader to join in with Barbara Havers in hating Lindley. And in that book, Barbara Havers is a character, the first character that you meet of, of the continuing characters in advance of meeting Thomas Lindley. And so you see him and hear about him from her point of view. And her point of view is this guy is just you know, it's just a fop. He's a, he bought his way into the, into the Metropolitan Police. And she just pretty much hates everything about him, assumes that he, you know, with all his class and privilege, that he's probably, you know, having sex with all the female officers and other employees and et cetera, et cetera. So then when, uh, when the reader finally meets Thomas Lindley and spends a little time with him, my hope was that the reader would say, oh, come on, he's really not that bad. <laughs> and so, so as he wins Havers over, he would win um, the reader over as well. So that's how she was created. And then over time, of course, because if characters are gonna grow, change and develop, well, I didn't want her to spend an entire series hating Thomas Lindley. That would be ridiculous. We get really tiresome. So I saw their relationship as something that could grow and it could demonstrate something that I wanted the books to demonstrate, which was a man and a woman could work together closely and come to love each other dearly. And at the same time, have it be completely not sexual. So these are two individuals who truly love each other, but there's like no way they would, I mean, the, both of them would laugh their heads off at the idea of having sex with the other person. Uh, so I wanted to, to look at that. So over time, you know, it's been a lot of fun because she can, uh, she can really uh, push his buttons. She knows how to do it. She gets such a kick out of doing it. You know, she does exactly uh, what to do and what to say. One of my favorite scenes in this book is where they're driving somewhere and they, I think they're going to the Isle of Dogs and they haven't had anything to eat. Uh, for lunch. And so she's going through this handbag. She has a shoulder bag. She has this huge shoulder bag. And she's just pulling out one piece of junk food after another, after another, breaking it in half and sharing it with Lindley. It was so much fun to do that kind of thing. So, and as far as her clothes go, well, you know, obviously she would have been fired a long time ago <laughs> For the were wardrobe choices, um, and certainly people at the at the at place of employment have encouraged her or dragged her someplace to get her something better to wear. But it's so much fun uh, seeing her uh, de deliberately make these sartorial choices that she knows are going to be totally inappropriate, and she does it anyway. Power to her. <laughs> That's what I say. <laughs> Um, let's see here. We have some more questions actually about other dynamics in the novel. Specifically, there are a couple about Lindley and uh, Deirdre. Um, we have one person's noting that his conversations with her are reminiscent of his early conversations with Helen. And they're wondering kind of about um, how he has evolved and if his understanding and loving of women has changed that much <laughs> um, after what happened with Helen. Well, that's a great question. I wonder if this, this person has read the book yet. This, uh, the, the book deals with that. Um, it deals, he has this, this moment of realization in the book. And oh, basically he has to have his butt kicked to have the moment of, uh, of realization, but he definitely has it. And, uh, and I wouldn't want to give anything more away. I wouldn't want to give it away. It's uh, actually, I will say this though. In the, in the scene where he uh, has this has the, has the conversation that leads to the realization. Okay, the conversation scene is my favorite scene in the book um, because he's, you know, he suddenly is sort of seeing what he has been doing. Oh, that's something to look forward to, I think, again, when you pick up your book or when it arrives in the mail. Um, thank you for, for that response there. Let's see. Oh, there are so many good questions. Goodness, I'm looking at the clock and seeing just a few minutes left. Um, okay, let's see here. We have um, one comment that's noting that Alice Hoffman um, from The Color Purple was a huge and very vocal advocate to end FGM. And they're wondering if you've had any contact with her in your work. 
Uh, with the with the writer Alice Hoffman, Is or the writings, maybe. Certainly, I've I've certainly have read her her novels, not uh, not all of them, but but a great number of them. Um, I I don't I don't know I've I've never read one of her books. If she has a book that's dealing with that deals with that, or if just just she's involved in it, that um, that I don't know. Oh, I just see a question that popped up saying, um, "Do you mean Alice Walker?" And I think that's, yeah, you probably, that's why I'm going, Alice Hoffman, it didn't sound like Alice Hoffman at all. Um, so, uh, no, I know nothing about Alice Walker's involvement in in that or her novels, a novel that might deal with that. The color, is that, was there, did she write a color purple? That's, uh, that is the only one of her books that I have read. We've got, we do have just some lovely comments that I wanted to point out to you, um, both in the comments and in the questions quickly. Um, one person is noting that they love your novels. You're an amazing writer, just great character development, deeply profound plots, especially this most recent book. And I'm so honored to meet you via Zoom. So, oh, thank you. Thanks thank very you. much. Um, we have someone also who's wondering, I know you touched on this a bit earlier in terms of the research that goes into all of these novels, um, but they're wondering specifically about how you're so well versed in British police procedure. Oh, well, um, I have uh, had a number of opportunities to interview the British police. Uh, right from you know from the very beginning when I was writing these books and I had no uh, no way to get in touch with anybody who could help me, I uh, as far as policing goes, I would just stop policemen on the street <laughs> and ask about it. And then I graduated from that to going into police stations. And uh, I, I the the first time that I actually had a police contact, it had to do with my book for the sake of Elena that is that takes place in Cambridge and at in, in Cambridge University. And so uh, the I needed to find out what would the involvement of the local police be if a, if a Cambridge a student at one of the colleges at Cambridge University is murdered, but not murdered in, in any of the colleges themselves. And so I went over to the police station and um, asked if there was somebody who could help me. I just basically said I needed to talk to a detective. And uh, they said, uh, well, you'll need to put that in writing. So I you know, went back to my hotel, wrote it, took it back to the police station. And a few hours later, uh, a detective called me. And so he and I became pretty good friends. And uh, he was my initial entree into actually talking to, you know, real policemen in the, in the police force. So um, I tried I also would try to uh, talk to the press officers too, because the press officers are, are what more available to the public, not working on a crime. They are, they deal with the press, and so they also could explain to me things about how uh, how crimes were uh, dealt with, and that, that's what I did in uh, for the book A Place of Hiding that takes place on the island of Guernsey, and. Uh, and so the information I got for that was from the uh, the press officer. So there are a variety of different ways. And now it's really pretty sophisticated because, uh, you know, I think they've become aware that they're sitting on this treasure trove of information. And now uh, there is the, I, there is a. Uh, a way that you can put in your request to talk to a British policeman, and if you're willing to pay per hour, they're really happy to help you. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so it's really, yeah, so you can get a lot of information that way. As you were speaking to um, Elizabeth, I thought you might like to know there's some additional really lovely comments, including from someone who notes they're from the same county in Ohio originally, as oh. you, and that they have a special connection. Um, <laughs> And someone else is noting with both of you, they just feel like you've been with them in their living room on this chilly Toronto evening. Oh, how cool. I bet <laughs> you that was my aunt. <laughs> <laughs> I know she, I saw her name click up just now and I thought, oh yeah, that's Auntie Ruby. <laughs> <laughs> with them. Um, sadly, just a few moments left. It, I do see one question um, that seems kind of relevant since we're doing this over Zoom instead of in person because of a pandemic. Um, they're wondering if the pandemic will feature in your next novel. Uh, no, no, because what I try to do is to, uh, to keep specific things that deal with the period of time um, 
to keep them out of the novel, to give them more of a, more of a timeless quality. Although now that, you know, technology moves so quickly that, you know, my earliest books were written before they even before we even had cell phones. And I remember at one point, my, uh, my British editor said to me, for God's sake, you have to give them mobile phones. And, and so, I, <laughs> so I did, but right now, um, you know, it, dealing with the pandemic would, I think, make it too, uh, um, it would focus in too much on, on time. It's the same thing. I don't talk about the queen anymore. Uh, I used to talk about the queen, figuring that she was going to live forever. And uh, now I, I don't refer to I, 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 anything at all. I, refer, I think I refer to the monarch. <laughs> you know? Yeah, we've all had enough of the pandemic anyway. So. Oh, yeah, really? Yeah. yeah we've pandemic out. <laughs> well, it's nice to get lost in a novel that's timeless or or at least maybe not in the pandemic time <laughs> yeah yeah i mean how much do we really want to know about the pandemic we are all living it we are um unfortunately it always amazes me how quickly an hour goes by but we are just about at the end i would love to thank you both elizabeth and jacqueline for being here with us tonight and speaking thank with you the thanks it was great Thank Thanks, you, thank Jackie. you, Elizabeth. Well, thank you very much. Gosh, what an honor. Whoa. <laughs> what great questions. <laughs> thank and you. And I want to thank all of you again, too, for joining us and all of the great questions, as Elizabeth just noted. Um, thank you for your engagement and being part of the Booksmith community tonight. For those of you who didn't have a chance to purchase a book yet or who wanted to add an additional book, um, you can do so through the page where you registered. I'm popping that in the chat now. Um, just as a reminder, they do come assigned book plates. Um, so thank you to Elizabeth for for that. Um, but I hope to see all of you or at least some of you at future events. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you for spending this hour with us. Thank 